Black Star Network is here. Oh, no! 
punch you. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Background. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, there's a difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Hey, folks, today is Thursday, October 13th. Sorry, October 12th, October 13th, 2022. Coming up on Roller Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network, a case out of Virginia Beach, Virginia, where Donovan Lynch shot and killed by a cop in 2021. Now, his family has filed a federal lawsuit against the city. We'll talk with the attorney, former Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax of Virginia, as well as Donovan's father, about this case. Also, today, January 6th uh, committee gave their final public hearing. Fol folks showed damning evidence that Donald Trump absolutely was involved and engaged in starting this riot, this uh, white domestic terrorist, on January 6th, 2000. And 21. They also showed riveting video of members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, uh, uh, sitting here calling for help and how he sat in his dining room and just watched it unfold and didn't do a damn thing. They also have issued a subpoena for him to testify before the committee. Also uh, on today's show, uh, we'll talk about the election, folks. A lot of new ads uh, uh, coming out. 27 days until the election. Democrats are increasingly concerned about Mandela Barnes in Wisconsin. Also, Dr. Oz is closing fast on John Fetterman in Pennsylvania. Democrats are also shifting money to Sherry Beasley in North Carolina. Tim Ryan, he destroyed J.D. Vance in their last debate. He is in the lead there, but again, it is tight across the board in all these Senate races and also in the House as well. So we'll break down what is going on uh, in the campaign as well as uh, the Election Defenders Coalition, uh, what is happening to protect rights uh, to voters. Folks, Democratic nominee for governor uh, in uh, Maryland, Wes Moore, will join us to talk about his campaign, not getting lots of attention. He very well could become the third African-American governor elected since Reconstruction. Also, in today's marketplace, folks, uh, we'll talk to Body by Chris. She says she has products that can actually get you to slim down and make your butt larger and without BBL, without Brazilian butt lift. Really? Yeah, we'll talk about her products as well. Folks, it is time to bring the funk on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is. All right, folks, normally when it comes to uh, a police shooting, we will be showing you the video right now, but in the case of Donovan Lynch in Virginia Beach, Virginia, there is none. Why? Because the officer did not turn on the body camera. That is one of the issues uh, that people are highly critical as it relates to this particular case. Uh, it was a shocking case, this young man uh, who was shot in March of 2021. Now, the officer involved, Solomon Simmons, was cleared of any wrongdoing, but Lynch's family is suing the officer and the city for wrongful death. The former Virginia Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax has joined Lynch's legal team. He and Donovan's father, Wayne, join us right now. Uh, glad to have both of you here. 
uh, Justin, let me start with you. First and foremost, yeah. again, I started with how in the world there's no body cam footage? Don't officers there actually have a body camera? What happened? Yeah, Roland. Well, again, thank you for highlighting this case. Uh, the officers do have body cameras, uh, but as you mentioned, the officer who unlawfully killed uh, Donovan Lynch uh, in March of 2021 did not have his body camera on and activated. And the uh, department has since uh, changed its policy and required that they be on, but it, it shows you the amount of negligence and gross negligence and the uh, killing uh, of Donovan. And there was so much more. Uh, there was actually no warning given to Donovan Lynch before he was shot and killed. And so this officer, within roughly seconds of encountering Donovan uh, and coming upon him, gives him no warning, does not have his body camera activated, shoots him twice, fatally, uh, and then they render little to no aid. Uh, and as others have pointed out, uh, they also left his body there for an inhumane amount of time. Uh, he was murdered roughly around midnight uh, of that night. It wasn't until 9 a.m., roughly. Uh, that his body was then moved uh, to uh, a place away from the scene. And so, you know, this really is a horrific case. Uh, it is one where Wayne Lynch, his extraordinary father, uh, has fought this fight for a very long time. I was honored to join as the lead legal counsel here and to fight for justice for Donovan, for this Lynch family that suffered for so long. Uh, and I'm joined in this fight by Thomas B. Martin, one of the finest lawyers in America. And we really are focused on getting justice. Uh, for this family and correcting these policies so that this does not happen to any other family in Virginia Beach, uh, anywhere in America. And really, the eyes of the world are on Virginia Beach right now. It has got to rise to this moment. Donovan should be here with us today. He should not have been killed uh, in the negligent and grossly negligent way in which he was. And not a single one of us, Roland, not a single member of the Virginia City Beach uh, City Council, uh, or the police department or any one of the 1.2 million uh, citizens there in Virginia Beach would want their child uh, to, when they go out to the oceanfront, just have dinner with their best friend and are walking back to their car to go home, to have them be come upon by an officer, shot without a warning, within seconds, with no body camera, and left there essentially to die. Uh, this has got to be corrected right now in this moment, uh, and we're going to get justice for Donovan. Um, Wayne, um, what happened here was, was Donovan involved in something as related to when the shooting took place, or was he simply an innocent bystander? Walk us through what happened on that fateful night. Uh, yes, Roland, thank you for having us tonight. Uh, Donovan has not been involved in any, I will say again, any illegal, criminal, or other activity throughout his whole life. He's always been a model student, a model citizen, an outstanding friend, a great scholar, entrepreneur, an athlete, and an advocate, and a change agent. Only thing Donovan did that night was, I would say, was in the wrong place at the wrong time. But what happened to him was totally uh, unnecessary. Um, he did not pose a threat. They have not once said what he was uh, ac actually doing to cause his death. Um, we know he was not committing any crimes. He was leaving the, the um, restaurant with his friend after a night out. And when he came out, it was a lot of chaos, and he was just getting out of the way, sir. And, and, and that's the thing right there, um, Justin, that is, that is so strange here. Right. Um, right. That, you know, you know, in this chaotic scene, an officers, officer says nothing, and now... Uh, we have to now rely on witnesses and and what they have to say, as opposed to having that having that body cam footage. And the reason police departments um, went to body cam footage is to be able to show in real time what actually happened, as opposed to relying on a police officer's account, where we know for a fact they oftentimes lie. Well, Roland, you're exactly right when you say that this is the whole point of body cameras. Uh, the entire point was for us to be able to see exactly what happened so the judgments could be made about whether uh, what the officer did was warranted or justified. And in this case, we know from reasons outside of body camera uh, that the actions were not justified, that, as Wayne said, Donovan should be alive. He was engaged in no illegal activity. Uh, he was simply uh, an, an innocent person, a law-abiding citizen, uh, walking back to his car. Uh, who got caught up uh, in the middle of some other activity that others were engaged in. But uh, this also, I think, is critical as well. Uh, the officer who shot and killed Donovan, uh, Solomon Simmons, uh, actually knew him. 
Uh, they had gone to school together a long time ago for one year in the ninth grade. Uh, and Donovan was a very recognizable person. Everybody loved him. He was 6'4", 305 pounds, not to be mistaken for anyone else. And to add to the negligence of the situation, you have an officer who actually had had prior contact with Donovan, actually gone to school with him, and yet even with that knowledge of who he was, shot him within seconds. Uh, and again, this has got to be ground zero for police reform, and there have already been some reforms uh, in the wake of Donovan's killing. And I think uh, if we look at this, uh, they now are mandating the body cameras be turned on. This was done very shortly after uh, Donovan's shooting. Uh, and they made some other reforms with a civilian uh, review board in Virginia Beach. And so that, to me, is really an acknowledgement that, that there were so many things wrong here. Um, but we have got to fight for justice for Donovan, because really fighting for justice uh, for all of us. I have, uh, and my wife, a 12-year-old son and an 11-year-old daughter. And if they want to go out to the beach, uh, they want to hang out with their friends and just come back uh, to their car and ride with their friends and then come home, they should be able to do that and do that safely. They should come home to us. And every family, every mother, father, grandmother, grandmother, aunt, uncle, should expect the exact same thing. So what Virginia Beach is saying uh, in this moment is that really nothing needs to be done uh, with the Lynch family. We're done here. Uh, and, you know, we, we can litigate this if you'd like, but, but I think we've uh, established that, that we're going to do nothing else. And I think that's wrong. Uh, and I think we now have a chance right now to uh, make a statement. And as you know, Roland, I'm a former federal prosecutor. I've litigated in the Eastern District of Virginia, uh, tried cases, and uh, am ready to make sure we get justice however long it takes for Donovan and for his family. But it's also a moment right now where the Virginia Beach City Council, uh, its leadership can step up, uh, can proactively step up and rise to this moment. We've seen this around the country. Uh, we saw it in Minneapolis uh, when, of course, George Floyd uh, was horrifically murdered. Uh, unjustifiably. Uh, we saw it when another citizen in uh, Minneapolis was murdered. Uh, in that case, it was a, a white female uh, who was unlawfully murdered by the police. And their city council stepped up and, and got to uh, a quick uh, settlement, but also wanted to make sure that they were made whole and that they reformed their policies and that people were held accountable. There has been no accountability in this case whatsoever. Donovan uh, has left us, in the earthly sense, for over a year and a half. Uh, and people, you know, are saying, well, what's to be done and throwing their hands up? Well, there's a lot to be done. Uh, and it starts with not only the reforms that need to be made to make sure this never happens again, uh, but with making this family whole, uh, not sitting back idly by and silent, but standing up in this moment uh, and rising to uh, the better angels of our nature. We have got to make the Lynch family whole. We have got to reform these policies. And this should never, ever happen again in Virginia Beach, anywhere in Virginia or anywhere in the United States of America. Um, and, and, and that's the thing right there, uh, Wayne, that, that, that just drives me crazy in that, and, and I keep trying to explain to people when these things happen, you can't come back from death. This isn't, right. isn't somebody who's been shot. This is not the case in, 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 in Texas where the kid is in the car uh, eating a hamburger and the officer fires shots. He does get injured, but he gets hospitalized. Death is death. And, right. and, and, there's, and there's two callous... Uh, of, an, a, a two, of an attitude, and frankly, when these DAs just go, oh, no wrongdoing. I, I don't understand how in the hell somebody uh, can be accidentally shot, wrongfully shot, and then nothing happens to the cop as if, oh, sorry, they're dead, right. my bad. Right, 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 that's right. That's right, Roland. It's, it's, it's outrageous, and it's got to stop, because here, here's the problem, Roland. If we do not take substantial action here, uh, and if the city council does not step up, again, proactively, not sit on their hands, not wait and see uh, the tides and the winds, and we know that the more uh, the media has looked into this, the more the eyes of the world have been on Virginia Beach. We know that that's made some folks very uncomfortable, but they can't sit in silence. I'd, I'd love for them to come out proactively and say, you know what, this was wrong. We're not going to simply hide behind uh, a litigation process. And again, we are fully prepared and ready to go uh, to do that. But it's been a year and a half. How much more does this family have to suffer? How many more seconds, hours, days, weeks, and months does the Lynch family have to live with this pain and with the reality that a lot of folks are simply standing by and saying there's nothing to be done? It's outrageous. And that's why, really, I was honored uh, to become the lead counsel here in this case, uh, again, joined by Thomas B. Martin, uh, just a great lawyer. And, and the reason that we are fighting so hard, uh, you heard it in the voice of Wayne Lynch, uh, who is, again, an extraordinary man. 
He raised Donovan for 25 years. Every second poured his heart and soul into this incredible young man, college-educated, entrepreneur, uh, gave so much to his community and said that he was going to change the world. Well, he is changing the world, but we need everyone to step up right now in this moment. We can't simply replay the exact same thing over and over and over again, because guess what? On March 26, 2021, it was Donovan Lynch. Uh, the next day, it was someone else. The next yep. day, it's someone else. Tomorrow, will be somebody else. It's got to stop. Wayne, final comment. Yes, I, I really do agree um, with Justin is saying. We have got to get uh, control of what's happening in our communities as far as the gun violence uh, and also police brutality. Um, like I said earlier, my son had nothing to do with anything uh, that occurred there. They were just uh, out with his friend for a night out after a long, um, long pandemic uh, season. And he was um, one of a kind, Roland. He was uh, a father's dream. And I just uh, want everyone to know that uh, Donald was the kind of person Donald was, not how they portray him. Well, we certainly uh, appreciate both of you joining us. Wayne, again, so sorry for your loss. I hate that we have to do these stories over and over and over again. But all right, well, I, got, I got some other stories I want to talk to you about, too. I got his foundation <laughs> that we're doing great things at yeah. the foundation. Okay. All right. Well, be sure to send us that information. Uh, and we Thank certainly you. appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Roland. Roland. Thank you, brother. Thanks for being such a leader, Roland. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. We're bringing in my pound, Dr. Greg Carr, Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University, to uh, Run Walker, founder of Context Media, Dr. Niambi Carter, associate professor, University of Maryland School of Public Policy. Uh, the, the thing here, and I, I just say it right there, uh, Greg, uh, is that I hate having to do these stories. I hate having to show these videos. I've had people say to me, Oh, you know, this is uh, this is traumatizing. We, we, we can't keep showing this. Uh, but I absolutely believe we make a mistake now I, if we don't do that. Now, I believe when mainstream media does it and does not provide the level of context and gives the level of depth to the stories, uh, then then they're playing off of that. Uh, but the thing here is this. If we start acting as if these things don't happen, then I believe the public then goes, well, it's out of sight, out of mind. I go back to, I always, th I always think about um, Mamie Till Mobley. The movie is opening uh, next week. And, and even on that particular point, it's a bunch of people already saying a bunch of BS about, oh, this is re-traumatizing us. They don't actually show the lynching in the movie. Uh, that, was by the, made, that was a point made by the director. She was not going to show that uh, again. But if we do not keep the focus on this, people are going to act as if, hey, we're all good. These things just don't happen. That's why we have to make sure that this stuff stays in the forefront uh, of, of people's minds. Absolutely, Roland. And um, <clears throat> the Emmett Tills, uh, the, the lynchings that we are more familiar with, and even those that we aren't as familiar with that have become historical, the bombing of Harry Moore and Harriet Moore's house, uh, on Christmas night that killed both of them in Florida. These are almost kind of like signposts. But really, what this story kind of re reiterates, the Donovan Lynch story, is the ordinariness of Black death. Mm. And I think this is what people are trying to tune out and evade. This, uh, to, to quote Slick Rick in another context, this type of shit that happens every day and the simple fact of the matter is that you have to do what you're doing. Of course you don't want to do this. But we have almost become immune in some ways to mm. the idea of black death. And it is this ordinariness. I mean, in this case, of course, uh, good to see Brother Fairfax back out there on the battlefield with his original uh, sword, which, of course, is his law degree, and to see him on the side of the angels. And, of course, they've approached the Department of Justice, and we know what they're going to say down there, Virginia Beach. The standard defense, they've already floated it. We, we uh, train our officers, uh, and we do it, and they had proper training, which means they're going to hang this guy out to dry if they can and say, basically, he violated the rules. But that's not enough. Finally, it's the cumulative effect of telling these stories to bust through this kind of, uh, uh, in, in a sense, this kind of almost becoming immune to these stories. You have to tell them, and you have to tell not just the same story over and over again, as in the case of Emmett Till. We have to tell that story again, of course. But you have to now allow the cumulative weight of this assault on Black life to collapse the chest of this system, because we're at an inflection point in this country. There's no doubt about it. 
you know, um, to run, there's so many of these stories, and they most of the time involve black black men. There are cases that also involve uh, black women. The Pamela Turner case is an example where that cop was acquitted. Hopefully, the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division is going to hit this guy with civil rights civil rights charges. Um, and, and I absolutely understand black pain and, and, and what we endure. Um, but I use a George Floyd example. If, if we did not have to watch over almost nine minutes his life being snuffed out, there's no way in the world that story had the impact that it did if, if the world was not forced to actually watch it. And, and, it, and it's painful that it has to happen that we have to have another black death. Um, but what we cannot do is let the rest of these people get off by saying, no, 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 we're not gonna show it, we're not gonna talk about it, uh, you know, we're just gonna just mention it. No, 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 this has to be in the forefront and we must use these videos, use these stories as an example of folks, stop, stop saying there are a few bad apples because it can't just keep happening and happening, and happening, and happening, and it's just a few bad apples. Well, as you said, it is enraging to have to go through this almost every day now, where it seems like there's a new deck every other week. Um, the sad thing about all this is that this is in the best American tradition. What you're seeing now is a continuation of everything we've seen ever since the time we landed on these shores up until especially after Reconstruction, when the Klan became resurgent and there were lynchings every day. And this is in the tradition of the Ida Wells School of Journalism where she made a point of saying that there was a man lynched every day and she put that in the face of the white power structure. She put that in the face of the black um, complacent power structure as well. The sad, the, what's sickening about this is that what you're seeing is not so much a pushback against these things being shown, what you're seeing is the short attention span of the general public, and unfortunately, the black general public as well, because if you don't put stories in front of people on a daily basis, things become out of sight, out of mind. In the wake of George Floyd, that, there was sort of a groundswell of awareness around the world about the plight of black people in America and what we were dealing with against the police. Um, now that some of that energy is kind of dwindled away, and now that some of that uh, passion and some of those daily stories have kind of gone away, People have gone back to being complacent, and it's almost like the way you see in other populations when it comes to school shootings and mass shootings. It's become so complacent in American society, so of course it would be, make sense for the killing of black men and black women by police to be complacent in, in American life as well, because that barely gets any mention all anyway. Now, two things here. Even if we take away the idea of this black man being wrongfully killed, there were so many police procedure, police procedural failures that happened that are more than enough to get this officer called to account. For instance, why was his body camera turned off? If that is supposed to be received procedure, why was he violating that procedure? What happened up until the point that that man lost his life that we don't see? The other part of that is, you know how hard it is to get a conviction of a police officer even when there's footage, even when there's video. There's no telling how hard this is going to be to try to get a conviction or even get charges brought against this officer with, with just he said and he, she say and his word against um, against this man's family. It's going to be it's going to be horrific. Um, the other the other thing I want to say is this. There, what, whatever that gentleman was doing, whatever he whatever he was whether he was guilty or innocent, whether he was a good person or a bad person, none of that matters. If you have a suspicion of somebody in, in, in the middle of any wrongdoing. You have a responsibility as a police officer to follow the law when you're apprehending a citizen. You have the responsibility to respect the rights of anybody you're thinking about questioning. What we're seeing now is the fact that your black skin is a weapon. It doesn't matter whether you have a gun or not. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter if you are guilty or innocent. In this country, your black skin is a weapon. If you're a black male, your skin is doubly a weapon, and we have to be aware of that. So talking about that and making the general public aware of that is what we have to keep doing. The, um, you know, you know uh, Niambe, as we sit here and, and look at um, these efforts to drive more funding, uh, right now, Republicans are beating Democrats over the head 
on the issue of crime. One of the reasons the races in North Carolina, in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, in Wisconsin, in Florida uh, have uh, gotten even closer is because of the blitz of ads by Republicans about crime, crime, crime. And they've been able to, to weaponize, defund the police uh, and beat Democrats over the head. I mean, Keith Ellison, the guy who literally led the prosecution of the cops who killed George Floyd, uh, is in an absolutely tough, close race in Minnesota because the sheriffs in that state have, have weaponized his son as one of the defund the police leaders and are beating him over the head with that. But what, and I, what I keep saying is, but they say nothing about cases like this. Mm -hmm. They say nothing about those families uh, who don't have a loved one sitting across from them at the dinner table. They say nothing about any of that as if that didn't happen. And then it's kind of like, well, you know, those are, th those things happen and they're rare. Y you can't tell a mother or a father who can no longer hug their loved one, hey, sorry, these type of shootings are rare. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not rare. That's the thing, Roland, because we only talk about the murders. We don't talk about the number of people who've been harmed and maimed by police uh, gunfire. So that's part of it. But I think the fact that we even have to sit here and talk about what a good young man Donovan Lynch was or what a nice boy Dante Wright was or what a good woman Sandra Bland was tells us something about the dehumanization that we experience in this country. The police are just a manifestation of the way we talk and treat Black people in this country. And when we do, you know, the, the few bad apples thing and we can feel proud about ourselves for trotting out the Derek Chauvin's of the world and, you know, the, this this officer here in Virginia Beach, all we're doing is leave the foundation of white supremacy untouched, which is why after reform, after reform, after saying we need to do policing from a human rights perspective and, and ensure the dignity of all people and all of this stuff, we can still see the murders of our loved ones, of our children, of our community members happening every single day. The shootings, the beatings, right? The blatant disrespect. So we focus on the sort of more spectacular elements of this, which are the sort of murders because of the finality. And I'm like everybody else. I mean, there are some that just catch you off guard and you can never shake it. But what about the number of people who are beaten in our communities, who are fearful? Because we know there are officers right now in DC, for example, who've been reinstated to the police force, currently getting a check, who've been labeled a threat to the community. So this is not something that we can just say, oh, you know, there are a few bad apples. This is a practice and a pattern, right, in our country when we talk about law enforcement and when we talk about our communities. For example, we can use it politically. I mean, police officers are one of the few agencies that can get all the funding in the world with no proof that anything that they're doing is actually helping Right? Like, all we have to do is say, there's more crime, we need more money. And somehow it, there always seems to be more money for police, less money for social programs, less money for poverty reduction, less money for affordable housing, all the things that we know make for safer, healthier communities all the way around, not just where crime is concerned. And we know when people say crime in races, whether it be Maryland or Pennsylvania or anywhere else, who they're talking about. Right. Crime is just a dog whistle because that's one way to get people riled up yep. to think about black folks. And then, you know, ta-da. But here's the deal. We're going to talk about it later. But the reality is that has always been very effective with white voters in this country. Oh, absolutely. Uh, hold, For sure. That's uh, what I mean. Yeah. Hold tight one <laughs> second, folks. We're going to talk about crime next. And that is those white domestic terrorists who committed massive amounts of crime on January 6th. Damning video released today by the January 6th committee. We're gonna talk about that also. Again, we'll, we'll break down what is happening politically. We are 27 days away from the midterm elections and the races are getting closer. It's tighter, there's so much that is at stake. Uh, Republicans desperately want to take over the House as well as the United States Senate. Democrats are trying to hold on to at least one of those chambers. It's 50-50 in the Senate. Uh, and again, the odds of them holding onto the House are slim as well. And so we'll talk about that, the impact of, of really what's happening in the election. Uh, and so a lot more to cover right here here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. First of all, if y'all watching on YouTube right now, almost 2,000 folks, why we, got 2000, why we don't have 2,000 likes? Y'all, this is real simple. If you pop on and watch, click the like button. It ain't that hard. 
and so just click the dog on like button. When I come back from this break, I should see 2,000 likes, okay? And understand, when you click that like, it has an impact on the video being recommended in the YouTube algorithm, which also drives the revenue for the show. And so I'm not just asking you for it because I want to see some likes. That also helps us economically when it comes to this show. Now, if you want to download the Black Start Network app, uh, we should. We, there's no reason we shouldn't be at 50,000 downloads right now. Uh, Keenan, send me a, a text. Let me know where we are at right now with our uh, downloads. Keenan is my digital guy. Uh, but you should download the app, folks, and where all of our shows, all of our content, not just my show, Project Muhammad show, shows from Deborah Owens, Jackie Hood, Martin, uh, from uh, Stephanie Humphrey, from Greg Carr, and Rolling with Rolling are all on the platform, plus uh, all of our specials, all of the other things that we cover. And so everything that we do is right there on the app. Download it on Apple. Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Also, the dollars you give to support this show allows us to do what we do. Uh, so please support us financially. Send your checks and money orders to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. Uh, and folks, uh, if you give during the show uh, to Cash App, PayPal, Venmo, or Zelle, I'll shout you out during the show. Our goal is to get 2,000 people this month contributing at least 50 bucks each uh, to raise $100,000. Uh, again, I told y'all last night. Uh, the monthly expenses to do what we do is $184,000, okay? That's real. So when I hear people talk about what we need and we need our own black news and our own people, our coverage, y'all need to understand that stuff actually costs money. Staff costs money. Uh, the internet costs money. Uh, everything costs money. I told you last night, our Comcast bill to do fiber, to, to be sure, because remember, when we did the previous location, we got knocked off the air several times. Well, that alone is almost $3,000 to have the highest level uh, of, uh, of internet. This ain't, this ain't your home Wi-Fi, y'all. That's not what it is. And so, uh, and so just a perfect example of what the costs are for what we do. And so uh, that's why uh, it matters, and that's why your support absolutely matters. And so, again, if you give 50 bucks a year, that, that averages out to $4.19 a month, uh, 13 cents a day. That's what it averages out to, y'all. Uh, and so that's what I'm talking about uh, in terms of what we do. Uh, Keenan just hit me a text. We are, we are at 49,074 downloads. We need 926 more to hit 50,000. Y'all should be downloading the app right now. And so, uh, so again, the giving part is critically important. Yes, I was on two advertising calls today, but that, but it's called conversation. That ain't actual money coming in. And so we are pressing hard uh, to drive the advertising revenue, uh, but that it is not easy when you're black owned media. Cause I told you 322 billion spent every year in black owned media, we're getting point five percent of the 300 that's all black owned media y'all that's all black owned media we're getting 0.5 to 1 percent of the 322 billion spent every single year that's what we're fighting up against uh, and so that's what's going on so please support us if you can uh, that's how you can actually give. And don't forget, you can get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Brownie of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Available on Ben Bella Books, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, IndieBound, Bookshop, Chapters, uh, Books A Million, uh, Target. You can also, of course, download it from Audible and order it from your favorite black bookstore. We'll be right back. When we invest in ourselves, our glow, our vision, our vibe. We all shine. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Libraries empower the community with education. Liberia Economic Development Initiative, LEDI, is hosting the International Life Changers Awards and Liberia's Bicentennial to celebrate LEDI building the country's first modern public library and technology center. Join event host Roland Martin, our honorees, Reverend Dr. Jamal Bryant, Zernona Clayton, Thomas Dorch Jr., Dana Lupton, Dr. Tammy Grace Deal on October 29th at the CNN Center Atlanta. There are no public libraries in Liberia, but together we can change that. Get tickets at ledinow.org. When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. You know what's on the ballot. It's not just legislation and policies we believe in. It's democracy. Our democracy. 
There's a choice on the ballot between freedom and fear, between cruelty and compassion, between chaos and community, between voting or violence, and the end of rights generations have fought for. The extremists have a plan, a roadmap for a nation where your voice is silenced and your vote is a memory, where they count their votes and cast ours aside. That's why this year, this fight, this vote is so important. Register, engage, volunteer, fight back against the disinformation and despair, and most of all, vote, because your vote is all that stands between our future and theirs. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Vivian Green. Hi, this is Essence Atkins. Hey everybody, this is your man Fred Hammond, and you're watching Roland Martin, my man, unfiltered. All right, folks, so the January 6th committee that's investigating the white domestic terrorist attack on the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021 held their final hearing today. Uh, they showed even more damning evidence uh, of how complicit Donald Trump was in that particular day uh, to the point where the committee actually uh, issued a subpoena to uh, the orange one. Other witnesses have also gone to enormous lengths to avoid testifying about their dealings with Donald Trump. Steve Bannon has been tried and convicted by a jury of his peers for contempt of Congress. He is scheduled to be sentenced for this crime later this month. Criminal proceedings regarding Peter Navarro continue. And Mark Meadows, Donald Trump's former chief of staff, has refused to testify based upon executive privilege. The committee's litigation with him continues. Mr. Chairman, at some point, the Department of Justice may well unearth the facts that these and other witnesses are currently concealing. But our duty today is to our country and our children and our Constitution. We are obligated to seek answers directly from the man who set this all in motion. And every American is entitled to those answers so we can act now to protect our republic. So this afternoon, I am offering this resolution that the committee direct the chairman to issue a subpoena for relevant documents and testimony under oath from Donald John Trump in connection with the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. General Lady yields back. If there's no further debate, the question is on agreeing to the resolution. Those in favor will say aye. 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 Those opposed is no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Mr. Chairman, I request a recorded vote. A recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Cheney? Aye. Ms. Cheney? Aye. Ms. Lofgren? Aye. Ms. Lofgren? Aye.
Oh, also during the he hearing, the committee showed never before seen the footage of what Democratic and Republican leaders were doing, how they were scurrying, trying to get some help. Donald Trump lied by saying Nancy Pelosi and others did nothing, called no one. Folks, this video, now we all know he a damn liar. We, we know he's a liar. He lies about lies. Uh, but this video shows you how scared they were and it shows you how inept these people were, how ridiculous they were, uh, and frankly, how shameful they were. Watch this. Uh, we're, start, we're starting to get surrounded. They're taking the uh, north front scaffolding. Look, unless we get more munitions, we are not going to be able to hold. The door has been breached, and people are gaining access into the Capitol. <laughs> We have got to get finished the proceedings. USA! USA! Senator Schumer is at a secure location, and they're locked down in the Senate. There has to be some way we can maintain the sense that people have that there's uh, some security or some confidence uh, that government can function and that we can elect the president of the United States. Did we go back into session? We did go back into session, but now apparently everybody on the floor is putting on two gas masks to prepare for a breach. So I'm trying to get more information. They're putting on their tear gas masks. <laughs> we need an area for the council members. They're all walking over now through the tunnels. I'm going to call up the effing secretary of DOD. We have some senators who are still in their hideaways. They need massive personnel now. Can you get the Maryland National Guard to come too? I have something to say, Mr. Secretary. Well, I'm going to call the, the mayor of Washington, D.C. right now and see what... Uh, other outreach she has to other police departments as Senator uh, Leader Hoyer has mentioned. Hi, Governor. Uh, this is Nancy. Uh, Governor, I don't know if you had been approached about the uh, Virginia National Guard. Mr. Hoyer was connect, uh, speaking to uh, uh, Governor Hogan. Uh, but I still think you probably need the okay of the, uh, the federal government in order to come into another jurisdiction. Thank you. Oh my God. They're just breaking windows. They're doing all, all kinds of, and it's really that somebody, they said somebody was shot. It's just, it's just horrendous and all at the instigation of the President of the United States. Okay, thank you, Governor. I appreciate what you're doing. And if you don't mind, I'd like to stay in touch. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye -bye. Virginia Guard has been called in. Yeah, and I'm just talking to Governor Northam. And what he said is they sent 200 of state police and a unit of the National Guard. They're breaking windows and going in, uh, uh, obviously ransacking our offices and all the rest of that. That's nothing. The, uh, the concern we have about uh, personal harm, safety, personal safety, is it just transcends everything. But the fact is, on any given day, they're breaking the law in many different ways, and, and quite frankly, much of it at the instigation of the president of the United States. And now. Uh, if he could, could at least uh, somebody. Yeah, why don't you get the president to tell them to leave the Capitol, Mr. Attorney General, and your law enforcement responsibility. A public statement, they should all leave. This cannot be just we're waiting for so-and-so. We need them there now, whoever you got. You okay. have. You also have troops. This is Stunny Hoyer. Troops, okay. Yes, so we have a Fort little bit of time Air, to make that decision. Andrews Air Force Base. All right. Other military bases. Thank you. We Thanks, need Paul. active Bye. duty National Guard. How soon in the future can you have the place evacuated, closed, you know, cleaned out? I, I don't want to speak for the leadership.
how we can get this job done today. We talked to Mitch about it earlier. He's not in the room right now, but he was with us earlier uh, and said, you know, we want to expedite this and hopefully they could confine it to just one complaint, Arizona, and then we could vote and, and that would be, you know, then just move forward with the rest of the state. The overriding wish is to do it at the Capitol. What we are being told very directly is it's going to take days for the Capitol to be okay again. We've gotten a very bad report about the condition of, of the um, house floor with defecation and all that kind of thing as well. I don't think that that's hard to clean up, but I do think it is uh, more from a security standpoint of making sure that everybody is out of the building and how long will that take. I just got off with the vice president. And I got off with the vice president-elect. So I'll tell okay. But what we left the conversation with, because he said he had the impression from Mitch that Mitch wants to get everybody back to do it there. Yes. I said, well, we're getting a counterpoint that is, we could take time uh, to clean up the poo poo that they're making all over the, literally and figuratively in the Capitol, and that uh, it may take days to get back. I'm at the Capitol building. I'm literally standing with uh, the chief of police of, uh, of the U.S. Capitol Police. He just informed me what you will hear through official channels, Paul Irving, your sergeant at arms, will inform you that their best information is that they believe that uh, the House and the Senate will be able uh, to reconvene in roughly an hour. Good news. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Good news. Time. Now, uh, folks, what, what is amazing about what, what happened today, not only when it came to that footage, they also detailed some of the communications they uncovered from the Secret Service, how this idiot Donald Trump literally was trying to walk to the U.S. Capitol. He wanted to march with him. The Secret Service was like, hell no. Uh, they talked about how uh, Pence was in trouble. We could go on and on and on. The, the, the thing that is still shocking and stunning to me uh, as the committee keeps laying this stuff out uh, uh, Niambe is uh, this is why I have complete and utter disdain for any Republican on the local, state, and national level who continues to stand with this thug, who mm -hmm. continues to make excuses for what took place. Uh, when you see this video, there is no way in hell, there is no way in hell that was a group of black people and that would have been the reaction. That would have been black people slaughtered on that mm -hmm. day had we saw that. We would have had more than a thousand black folks shot and killed on that particular day. To watch members of Congress having to call the governors of Virginia and Maryland begging for National Guard to come to the Capitol uh, uh, is clear. The, and these people literally do not care. They want to put this fool back in. And I keep warning all these black folk. And, and look, I totally understand uh, in terms of demanding uh, whatever we desire from Democrats. But I keep reminding people, you can demand something, but you can't just demand it during the election season and then not put the pressure on them after the election to actually get it. I keep trying to explain to these people what these Republicans have in mind. If they win the House or the Senate, everything they try to do on January 6, 2021, they actually want to do if they win. 
They are running election deniers. They are running people right now who are saying, if we win secretaries of state, we're going to put Donald Trump in. They want to bypass laws. They want to bypass the, the results from the public. They absolutely want to finish in 2023 and 2024 what they started on January 6th. Well, I don't know how anybody who's been paying attention or listening can think these people are joking. They're telling us exactly what they're going to do. They've been telegraphing it for years. They worked out various scenarios. I mean, we heard some of them today. And they certainly were there not just to sort of have a, a peaceful discussion about the election. They were prepared to kill people that day, right? When that woman was demanding that they produce Nancy Pelosi, they were coming in. That's exactly what they did. And I think it's important for people to think about the fact that this has never happened, right? That the amount of people that showed up that day that went through multiple lines of federal police and local police, right, to breach the Capitol, to go after people, and then to turn around and have any conversation about their movement as if it's legitimate and lawful, I think is, is an even bigger slap in the face to even think about, like, if these were Black people. Because we saw how many police showed up when people were just peacefully protesting about the murders of Black people in the street. And that got out National Guard and everything a lot quicker in D.C. than it did on January 6th. And this thing was certainly uh, poised to be violent. I mean, they were erecting gallows that morning. So this was, I think, uh, um, a first shot across the bow. And we've done nothing in the last two years since this event, right? This is the first election cycle we're going to be in since January 6th. And we've done nothing to this since this event to shore up not just our federal elections, but our state elections, our local elections to keep things from like this from happening. Because these people aren't just showing up. And you already talked about this at, at, at the national capital. They're also on the ballots in places like Arizona because they want to be the people who get to say whether your vote counts or not. So I think people can be disheartened with the Democrats. I think people can even be conservative and may want to vote Republican. But you cannot do that and look at the, look anybody in the face and say that you believe these people believe in anything other than their own power, and in particular, the power of whiteness and the power of, of white heteronormative patriarchy. They don't care for women. They certainly don't care for black folks. And I think giving them your vote because you have grievances, and I'm not saying they're illegitimate, about reparations and other kinds of things is foolhardy because these people will give you nothing of what you want for sure and certainly may give you more than what you bargain for when you think about their stance on criminal justice and voting rights, et cetera. Uh, Toron, um, the, the action is there. I mean, every time I, I see one of these videos, I, when they, you see the video of them uh, yelling the cop, cop down, uh, get up, get up. Then they show these, they show these messages. Uh, where they detail the arms they were bringing, the ammunition they were bringing. They also detail how the Secret Service, how the people, they, they were sending a no, note to the FBI saying, they are coming to do this. Uh, and I saw one uh, uh, analyst who said that based upon what the warnings, they said on any other regular, or any regular person, the Secret Service would have shut that event down. I mean, they were being warned thousands of people are coming with ammunition and guns. And the fact of the matter is, Donald Trump knew what was happening. His folks knew. They all knew. And, and they had a very clear plan on that particular day. And, and the fact of the matter is, we still don't have those Secret Service text messages. We don't know how many Secret Service agents actually were aligned with Donald Trump and in support of that as well. And so when you talk about the Secret Service uh, and folks uh, being uh, close to him who wanted to, uh, who wanted to see him still in power, that scares the hell out of you, especially when we still have not had an arrest of the person who left some pipe bombs outside of the DNC uh, headquarters when, when, when the Vice President-elect Kamala Harris was there visiting. We, that still, that case still has not been closed. And there's no way in the world the Secret Service of all agencies did not discover those pipe bombs um, before uh, she arrived. You know, um, this is the this is the I think this was the tenth time I've seen footage of this this um, white supremacist riot. And every time I see footage of what happened that day, I keep thinking to myself, as you said at the top of the segment, if the nation or the Panthers had even thought about trying to put something like this together, and if they had even gotten as far as the front lawn or the steps of the Capitol, 
Washington, D.C. would have looked like the first 10 minutes of Saving Private Ryan, and we know that. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is you can't really talk about these issues without talking about the fact that you don't have a movement of that many people with that much traffic on social media without somebody in law enforcement or in intelligence services not knowing about that. And as you said, it's really fascinating to me that nobody's really talking about that. You see one or two stories about that there were messages being passed back and forth between certain um, agents in the FBI and people in the Secret Service, but nobody's come forward to either say who this was or go into the details of just how extensive that support was. I mean, you look at the footage of it, you see people fighting cops with spears and with um, homemade shields, knocking cops down and pushing them over banisters. And the response from the police departments in those areas is a lot more mild than you get from people marching up and down the street during a protest against police brutality, like this sister said. Um, the other thing is this. You're correct that this is an election year. And looking at the footage of Pelosi and Schumer and the rest of their staff talking about trying to keep order in the... In, in the uh, in the Senate at that time, if I was a Democratic strategist, I'm not, but I do know media, what I would do is basically show those footage, show that footage. I would maybe edit it very little and just show that this is the alternative. Do you want to see this marching on the Capitol again, or do you want to see some form of order, whether you like it or not, whether you like these people or not? And I have serious issues with the Democrats. I'm not, I'm not shy about saying that. But if we're talking about messaging, you have to get your messaging in front of the people because people see that the fact that January 6th happened, the country did not collapse. And what happens is the same thing we were talking about earlier when it talks about police brutality. If, some, if people don't see something catastrophic happen to their individual lives, they get complacent with it and they get real comfortable. So you have to show people the danger of what's happening and you have to show them the possibility of what could happen if you don't get active and you don't get animated. And I don't think that's what's happening. A lot of the messaging is pushing this to the side. I do think it's an important thing that we're seeing the committee, and that's getting um, a lot of play. But this was a very dangerous thing that happened, and I don't think the Democrats are doing a good job of putting that message out there to saying that we are the alternative to this. If you don't right. get focused and you don't get active and you don't get energized, this is what's going to happen. And the last point I want to make is, if you look at the history of right-wing movements around the world, they usually started out with some sort of um, protest or some sort of active energy like this. If you look at what happened in, Mar in, in, in Mussolini's Italy at the beginning of, um, in 1922, the March on Rome, almost the exact same thing happened when the fascists marched on Rome in 1922. It just happened to be successful that time. If you look at what happened in Hitler's Beer Hall Putsch, he created some sort of the, almost the exact same scenario in Munich. It was unsuccessful. What they did was, once the Nazi party got outlawed, they moved into legislative politics. People don't know that. And that's what happened. When they said, we can't win this way, what we'll do is we'll start moving people into the electoral process. And that has to be made known to people. If you don't win with physical force, you can come around and you can move into electoral politics. And that's what the right wing is doing, and they're doing it very well. The left and the Democrats have to get on top of that and start doing the exact same thing and making this session known. Well, Greg, here's the deal. If anybody is also paying any attention to world politics, uh, what you're seeing, and again, there's a reason I wrote my book, White Fear. As you have the browning of America, as you've had the browning of Europe, what we are dealing with right now on immigration, Europe has been dealing with the last 10 to 15 years. We have seen in Italy, in Germany, in France, in several different countries, uh, how they have been pushing back against immigration because, frankly, their white birth rates have been going down. Well, the bottom line is you need people. So this notion of great replacement theory. So what is now happening? You now seeing these countries now uh, shift to this, these, these far right candidates, these fascist candidates, who are using the rhetoric of nationalism, the exact same thing Donald Trump uses, the exact same thing the Republican Party uses, because what they are scared to death, they are scared to death of white people losing power, losing control. And so how do those white voters, what do they do? They coalesce around their candidates and they're voting in their numbers. I keep telling black people, let me be real clear, these white folks are holding on to this thing as long as they can. You are seeing the enthusiasm on their side. And again, I get folks out there saying, well, we haven't gotten this and gotten that. Let me be real clear. That's not a damn thing that black people say they want. And Greg, I saw this thread you were on a little bit early and this fool was just talking. Let me be <laughs> real clear, everybody watching. That's not a damn thing you want that the right 
is going to give you not one of them. Not one of them. That's right. Not one. You, all y'all folk who, yeah, reparations, there is not a single Republican who supports reparations. Not <laughs> one. So I can guarantee you they're going to make sure that never happens. Okay? Let's just be real clear. You ain't even going to get a study. You can forget <laughs> H.R. 40. That ain't even go. Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee told me when I was in Texas, they have 217 co-sponsors for H.R. 40. Not one of them a Republican. Hello, they win the House, you can hang that up. And so we can go on and on and on. And so for the people sitting at home who are saying, yeah, man, I'm going to sit this one out. Okay, but let me tell you right now. Go ahead and write it down. Roland Martin said at 711 on October 13th, 2022, you ain't getting shit <laughs> if the Republicans take control of the House and the Senate. Nothing. Greg, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, what else is there to say? I mean, in order to get reparations, and uh, we've got a board meeting coming up, the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, I'm on that board. In order to get reparations, you have to have a functioning government. You have to have a functioning government. These white boys getting ready to break this thing. I'm not saying in the long arc of world history that that's necessarily a bad thing, but I am saying that they're getting ready to break it. Um, and this isn't about facts. This isn't about uh, logic or arguments. W.E.B. Du Bois, who had done the Atlanta University studies for the better part of a decade in Atlanta, before in 1906, September 1906, they lynched a brother and put his knuckles on display in a butcher shop in downtown Atlanta before they came out to go over the hill and kill everybody on the Atlanta University Center Hill till black folks came with them guns and said, bring it, let's dance. Du Bois after that said, I thought the world was thinking wrong about race. But what he realized was you can't win arguments with people who are locked in ideology. So you just heard Dr. Carter lay it out and Brother Walker lay it out. When you start talking about ideological wars, we are in a knockdown, drag out fight. And by a knockdown, drag out fight, I'm saying that, you know, there have been some recent polls since this summer, since the September, uh, the January 6th committee, commission has been meeting, that show that the voters who uh, reply to the questions of how are you influenced by all this footage and all these hearings, they are relatively unswayed. This isn't about logic. Mandela Barnes should punch that ghoul Ron Johnson straight in the face when he starts talking about crime since he voted against at least $50 billion in federal dollars, including millions that were coming to uh, Milwaukee, including some money to hire about 60 more cops in Milwaukee. But the facts don't matter because these people realize, as you say, Roland, and as you've written in White Fear, it's rule or ruin. So what are we facing? What are we seeing today? Donald Trump said today after they voted to uh, subpoena him, uh, he's floated the idea, I'd like to testify as long as it's live. I hope he does testify. And now, of course, his lawyers are trying to tell him, don't do that, we can drag it out. But see, here's why Donald Trump wants to testify. That's what people are missing. He wants to testify because he understands that his followers, and he didn't create this, as, 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 as Torrance Tur said, he has inherited this. His followers don't care about facts. He's their avatar. He's the avatar of the moment of white supremacy. He wants to testify live so he can rally the base, so they can get a brain-dead man in Georgia who just told another damn joke about uh, having sex and getting cows pregnant with chinless Tom Cotton standing behind him in the United States Senate. He wants to testify live because he understands why we talking about facts, they talking about power. These are two different things. Finally, the Supreme Court today, this afternoon, rejected Trump's attempt to overturn, in their appeal, to overturn the 11th Circuit's uh, uh, prohibition for them being able to go in and get these documents by declassifying the documents. Now, you know, Clarence Thomas couldn't save him. But what the Supreme Court is facing right now is a crisis of legitimacy. Because never forget, as you say, we would have been shot. But let's be also be very clear. In 2000, when Jeb Bush and the Florida legislature stole the election of 2000, People in the United States Congress, Congressional Black Caucus, couldn't get one co-signature from the United States Senate to put that on the into the Senate to stop uh, to to require Florida continue to count the votes. B B Bush versus Gore was about stopping the count in Florida. And remember John Roberts and all them, all them boys, uh, Kavanaugh, they were lawyers at the time on the side of Bush's people in Florida. Why am I bringing it up today? 
everybody should be paying attention to this case that's coming before the Supreme Court. And you've been talking about it, Roland, Moore versus Harper, the independent state legislature theory. Yep. They are setting it up so that, and I know you're going to talk to these folks who are organizing poll watchers, they are setting it up so it's not just secretaries of state that will give the election to the white nationalists if they lose. They are training poll workers now, not poll watchers. I'm talking about the people when you come up to, 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 to vote, they're training the people who are going to look down in the book and match your name. Yep. And if the legislature still, if you still can't stop, if you still win the popular vote, Moore versus uh, Harper, the Supreme Court's getting ready to tell you that I don't give a damn if you win Georgia by a million votes. If the legislature is run by the white nationalist party, they can set it aside, baby. They're getting ready to break this. And when they break it, it's not going to be put back together. Because when you look at uh, Joe Biden, he just released his uh, uh, regular, you know, the president has to put this national security report out every year. The biggest threat, they say, is Russia and China. Well, guess what? While this is going on in the United States, the rest of the world has moved on. And the only thing they want from the United States is cheap goods, continue to stabilize the dollar, and when you implode, we'll just pick off what's left. Nobody's going to weep for this country. It won't just be us not weeping. It's going to be the world not weeping. But these white boys getting ready to break it, Roland. I keep warning, folks. So y'all sit here and play around with this election uh, and don't show up. I'm telling you, white maggot Republicans, I said that for a reason, those MAGA folks, they will be voting early voting on election day. And so on, on November 9th, I don't want to hear folk go, oh my goodness, what happened? Because we told you what's going on. There are 27 days, and I'm telling you right now, Pennsylvania, y'all better make sure Fetterman wins. North Carolina, black folks, y'all should be lining up for Sherry Beasley. Florida, you should be lining up for Val Demings, because Marco Rubio don't give a damn about you. I'm telling you, Ron Johnson is in Putin's pocket. That man is one of the most, and he is a liar. He has said stuff privately, oh, election was fair, but publicly, he kisses Trump's ass so much, literally, his head is far up Trump's butt than Lou Dobbs is. <laughs> I'm telling y'all, what these people have planned has nothing to do with black America. And y'all can holler, oh, you've been the Democratic shield. Uh, y'all, is two damn choices. And I'm telling you, the right folks, the white right folks, they don't give a damn about us. They got a black man running in Michigan who says Niambi shouldn't be voting because she a woman. That's right. Yeah. Do y'all understand what's going on? They got no problem with a 10-year-old girl getting raped or having a, uh, or getting pregnant because of incest and saying, nah, you got to have a baby. We're going to show you one of the ads out of Texas, how they're combating that in our next segment. But, folks, I'm just trying to warn y'all right now. The agenda that they have, that they are trying to execute, is absolutely an anti-black agenda. It don't matter if they even got a black face running. Herschel Walker, Burgess Owen, Byron Donalds. I'm telling y'all what's happened. When we come back, we're going to talk about... Uh, the uh, an effort to deal with the issue of poll workers and what's happening uh, in these campaigns. Show you some also some political ads that also are going around as well, folks. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered uh, on the Black Star Network. Hey, YouTube, y'all hit the like button, okay? Uh, man, look, almost look, 3,000 now. We should be at 3,000 likes. This ain't hard. Download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Support our Bring the Funk family. Club, uh, senior check in money order to PO Box 57196, Washington, D.C. 20037 0196. Cash app, dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal's R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. And get your book, White, get my copy of my book, White Fear How the Brownie of America is Making White Folks Lose They Damn Mind. I should have put the damn in there. Uh, ben Bella Books, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Indie Bound, Bookshop, Checkers, Books a Million, Target. Order from your favorite black bookstore uh, as as well as uh, download it from Audible. I'll be right back. When we invest in ourselves, we're investing in what's next for all of us. Growing, creating, making moves that move us all forward. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Pull up a chair, take your seat, the Black Tape. <laughs> 
with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. When we invest in ourselves, our glow, our vision, our vibe, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. It's about us. Let's go. Everybody all together. We are in sunny South Dallas. The election is coming up. It's super important that folks know who they are voting for, but more importantly, what they are voting for. Y'all, we got the free shirts and free lunch right over here. Freedom is our birthright. No matter what we're up against, we're sending a message in Dallas and Texas and in the country. We won't black down. That's what this bus tour is all about. The housing cost is one of the most capitalized areas that we have found. People who are marginalized that are brown and black, we are suffering the most. And I think that we have the biggest vote and the biggest impact in this election. I'm voting for affordable housing, for sure. We should not be paying the cost of a utility failure because our elected officials are too proud to say, we need help. I know that we can bring out our people to vote. It's a part of our birthright. Right. It's a part of our heritage. And surely, it's a part of our prison, a part of our future. That's right. That's what's up. And we won't black down. Forward that message to five friends, because in that message, it's got links to how to get registered, how to check your registration status. Like I said, 2.30, we'll start um, rendezvousing right here on this street. I am voting to let our voice be heard in the rural communities that, hey, we are people too. There are things that we need. Free shirts, free food, and lots of power. We are in Longview, Texas, where black voters matter, 365. Whatever type of oppression a white supremacist throws our way, we will not black down. We are in relentless pursuit of liberation of our people. Freedom is liberation for black bodies and black communities to make economic change through political power. Freedom is choice. We won't black down. We won't black down. We won't black down. We won't black down. We won't well, black yeah, down. We won't black, black down. down. Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. What's going on? This is Tobias Trevelyan. Hey, I'm Amber Stevens West. Yo, what up, y'all? This is Jay Ellis, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> Maya Blomgren has not been seen since September 21st from her Rockford, Illinois home. The 15-year-old is 5 feet 5 inches tall, weighs 140 pounds, with black hair and brown eyes. Anyone with information about Maya Blomgren should call the Rockford, Illinois Police Department at 815-966-2900, 815-966-2900. Uh, folks, a pregnant black woman will have to serve four years in a South Carolina prison for her behavior in the May 2020 racial justice protest. A jury convicted Brittany Martin of breaching the peace in a high and aggravated manner for her words. Judge R. Kirk Griffin said Martin's prior criminal convictions contributed to her original sentence. Martin's attorneys pushed for the sentence reconsideration and expressed concern about her pregnancy as well as her health. 
Uh, folks, now let's talk about what's happening with uh, these elections. I told you uh, what's been going on all across the country where uh, Republicans, these maggot Republicans, uh, they have been running individuals for Secretary of State for election boards. They also want to unleash, uh, uh, unleash folks uh, on, on the polls as well putting all sorts of pressure on poll workers. Republicans have made it a lot easier for them to do so by passing uh, these new laws in Georgia, in Texas, and so many other different places. And so the question is, how do we counter that? Well, there are groups all across the country who are trying to do so. First of all, informing people of their rights when it comes to when they go to the polls. Also, trying to provide security uh, for the various poll workers as well. Uh, we, you know, we've been running one of the ads. We've been running, of course, um, uh, Eric, Congresswoman, er, Congressman Eric Swalwell uh, put an ad together talking about, again, uh, the importance of this election. And this has been all by design, what they are doing. Really what the goal is, is to intimidate people. I know poll workers, many of them who are older African Americans, uh, they have been quitting in droves because they don't want to deal uh, with the mess from many of these Republicans. Now the question is, we have uh, the Election Defenders Coalition. They are involved in trying to help protect voters, specifically voters of color from violence, intimidation, and misinformation at the polls in critical battleground states. Uh, two of the organizers join us right now. Tiffany Flowers, the campaign director for The Frontline, is in Baltimore, uh, and Angela Peoples, the national director of Election Defenders. She is from Miami. Glad to have both of uh, you here. As I said, uh, this, is, this is a very clear effort uh, by the right because what they want, we saw what happened in Georgia, where they went after uh, these black workers in Detroit as well. And they are, have a laser-like focus, Tiffany, on black precincts, black poll workers. Absolutely true. I mean, we saw it in 2020. I know many folks uh, looked at the January 6 hearings and remember our friend Miss Ruby. Um, and so we're we're building on a history of election protection work that we started in 2020 um, because we saw what was happening. We knew what was coming. We knew that they were planning. They were scheming. I mean, everything that you've said so far, Roland, is it just couldn't be more true about that. You know, our folks need to understand that there is a plan on every level to disenfranchise our votes from, um, you know, removing opportunities to vote by taking places. You remember in Wisconsin, there were six places to vote, uh, dwindled down to one. The idea that people are being texted misinformation about Election Day mysteriously moving and the fact that people do feel fear around what may or may not happen because of all the rhetoric and violence that we're experiencing in general, and that's where we come in. Um, Angela. Um, yeah, well, I, I would just say to Tiffany's point that we have heard a lot about the threats. We've heard a lot about the challenges. Um, and one thing that I know for sure is that in addition to uh, the talk, they're really trying to intimidate people uh, with, with their messages. But what we're hoping that people understand is that um, if you are worried that there might be um, someone that is a, a, a election denier at the polls on election day, that we will be there. The election defenders will be there. Uh, we are a, a coalition, a group of folks that are organized from across the country. Uh, we are looking to make sure that people are not only recruited to be volunteers, years uh, to show up on election day at key polling locations. But we also want to make sure that they're trained on uh, to be prepared to respond to high risk, high pressure situations um, that we think may be possible on election day. Um, but, but what's most important for us is that the people that we love, the communities that we care about, have an opportunity to vote with safety, dignity and joy. And that's the focus of the Election Defenders Program. Um, and so... Um, in terms, okay, fine. So defending, what are you doing? Are you, do you have uh, numbers set up, lawyers set up? I mean, what's going to be your apparatus? Because we got early voting, for instance, in Georgia, early voting begins uh, on Monday, October 17th. Election day is November 8th. And so what's the apparatus that you have set up where people can call, people can reach out to if they encounter problems? Well, the good news is, Roland, there has been a uh, infrastructure for not just election defense, but election protection on the legal side, as you're naming, 
on the voter information side, um, on the administrative side as well for years. Um, there are many organizations um, that have been building this infrastructure for a long time. Um, there's numbers like 1866 our vote that people can call if they're at a, a polling location and somebody is giving them incorrect information or they're not sure about the information that they're getting, they can make that phone call. But for us and the election defenders, as Tiffany said, we started in 2020 um, with an eye towards recognizing the increased threat of violence, of intimidation at the polling locations. And so our role as election defenders is to be in communication and coordination with that infrastructure that has existed for many years, um, to for legal challenges, for ballot curing. Um, if you're if you're if you have to cast a provisional ballot, um, there are opportunities to sort of what they call cure your ballot, basically making sure that um, you can actually get your vote counted. So taking that infrastructure and building on top of it with skills like conflict resolution, with skills that prepare people to be um, responsive to threats of intimidation, to be sharing information, to know when there's di um, dis or misinformation that's coming um, to the polling locations. We understand that um, in many states, like the state that I'm in, in Florida, um, some people have the right to show up to uh, a voting location and even challenge an individual person's ability to vote. Um, and, and so we are, we are working um, to train our election defenders to be responsive, not just to the legal issues, but to the interpersonal issues. For so many people, um, a lot of the reason that they turn away from the line uh, or they walk away from vote if, if they're in line to vote is because it feels too difficult. It feels like um, somebody's asking me too many questions or someone's challenging me or maybe the police are there and I'm not really sure if I'm comfortable dealing with the police there. We'll have election defenders there. You'll see us in our gold, our bright gold um, gear. Um, and we will be there not only to make sure um, that you're protected and that you can cast your vote with safety, dignity, and joy, but also that you understand that you're not alone, that we are a community of folks. And again, as I said, there is an infrastructure that we are building on top of for decades. Uh, folks that have legal support, we are in coordination and communication with them. So our volunteers that will be trained on the election defense skills, those basic kind of community organizing skills that allow people, that will allow people to feel safe at the polls, we are also going to be in deep coordination and communication with folks that are prepared to re take respond to those legal challenges, um, that know the, the election laws back and forward, um, and that are ready to help you deal with any, um, if you have to cast a provisional ballot or anything like that. Questions uh, from panel. Uh, Niambi, you first. Well, thank you both for the work you're doing. I'm so excited to see you both here. I was going to ask, how? what is your plan for combating um, these moments where we see, in some cases, like in Wayne County in Michigan, where um, poll workers, in particular um, GOP-affiliated uh, poll workers, are being told to just break the law, unplug machines, or other kinds of things that are just illegal. How do we, or how do you all have a plan to combat that kind of stuff? Because the denial of provisional ballots and other things are some of the things that we know happen, but this is a little bit more insidious than people just not knowing the rules. We're actually having people be coached on how to break the rules, essentially. Yeah, I, our, so our work, as Angela said, we do not actually, I will use an example of how we help outside of those locations and are in partnership with the poll workers. You remember Philadelphia in 2020 and how all of the activity was moved to the convention center. And so uh, I was there with Nalini Stamp and other people that worked on election defenders in 2020. And so our job and our role was to be um, the counter energy and the counter um, dispiriting that was happening with all the curiosity that occurred outside of the convention center. And so what we did was we paid for pizza, we gave out water, we had a DJ, we had de-escalators on hand. We made sure that there was a barrier between the people who were trying to agitate us and tempt a, our, our side into, um, you know, conflict and just made sure that people who were curious but also did not want to engage in any sorts of acts of violence or put themselves at risk, had people to, as Angela said, rally with and, and be in community with naming and knowing that we all just wanted to see every vote counted, 
make sure that people knew that there were people that would have their back if they if violence or other things were to erupt and also just to create an environment of, of actual community so our work doesn't actually intersect directly with going inside of the polls we work with trying to make sure the conditions outside remain safe and and calm as calm as possible so that the people inside can get their job done all right yeah. then Oh, uh, one, th one thing I'll just add very quickly, and I think you uh, mentioned it as well, uh, Roland, that part of their strategy is to sow confusion. Yep. Part of their strategy is to push for unrest. So as calm and as organized and as consistent and steadfast as we can be, the more likely it is that we will get the true election results and that they are honored all the way to certification. And so that's part of the role that we're playing uh, with the election defenders. All right, then. We certainly appreciate it. Thanks a lot uh, for your work. Thank you. All right, folks, coming, going to a break. We come back, we'll talk to Wes Moore, uh, who wants to become the next governor of Maryland. Uh, that's right. Uh, he is running against a MAGA Republican in Maryland, who even the current Republican governor, Larry Hogan, is not supporting. So we'll chat with Wes up next. Folks, uh, you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Uh, YouTube folks, hit that like button, y'all. Don't make any sense. I got to keep asking y'all to do it. OK, hit the like button. It ain't hard. It's a click. You can keep commenting. Uh, also, uh, folks, if you're, you can do the exact same thing, share on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitch, uh, talk or share on the Black Star Network. Speaking of that, download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Support the Bring the Funk fan club. Your dollars make it possible for us to do what we do. Check in money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. I told you I don't have millionaires and billionaires supporting the show. It's my donors, people who give one and five and 10 and 20 and 30 and 50 dollars that make it make us do what we do and so we appreciate it cash app is dollar sign rm unfiltered paypal r martin unfiltered venmo is rm unfiltered zale is rolling at rolling s martin.com rolling at rolling martin unfiltered.com and of course be sure to get a copy of my book white fear how the brown of america is making white folks lose their minds available at ben bella books amazon barnes and noble indie bound bookshop chapters books a million target order through your favorite black bookstore or download from audible we'll be right back We all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. I've always said this. Rather than to continue to fight for a fair piece of the pie and, and, and the equal slice of the pie, I want my hand on a knife that cuts the pie. And to that extent, who bakes the pie? And who, who puts it in? And that's one of the things that got me involved in going into politics in the first instance. I'm tired of people making decisions for me. Right. And mine. I want to be a part of that decision-making process. And luckily, it has paid off in terms of seeing the progress that many people in America have made, particularly the people of color. One thing bothers me now that we seem to be losing that. Right. By saying that we've got to be more concerned with other people than those people who were here. We built America. invest in ourselves. We're investing in what's next for all of us. Growing, creating, making moves that move us all forward. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, it's one thing to have a seat at a table, and it's another to be an investor on the cap table of a unicorn. We're talking venture capital with Leisha Bell and how generational wealth is built through early stage investing. I know very few people who do what I do and that's very unfortunate. And I think Silicon Valley has been unkind to black people. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Israel Houghton with Israel and New Breed. What's up, what's up? I'm Dr. Ricky Dillard, the choir master. Hey, yo, peace world. What's going on? It's the love king of R&B, Raheem Devon, and you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered.
All right, folks, we've told you about all the critical races happening, not just what's happening at the national level, but also there are huge state races as well. For the last uh, two terms, Republican Larry Hogan has been the governor of Maryland, uh, but Democrats want that back. Maryland is a blue state. Democrats control the legislature. Uh, and Wes Moore, he is the Democratic nominee for governor. If elected, he will be the third African-American since Reconstruction elected as governor. Douglas Wilder became the first in Virginia. Uh, of course, uh, you had uh, my man, uh, Deval Patrick in Massachusetts, who became the second, and Patrick would be number three. He joins us right now on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, glad to have you on the show. Looks like I wore the appropriate colors today uh, on uh, on Thursday. Greg Carr is an alpha, but so is Wes Moore. So I had to. So it was, you know, uh, that wasn't the plan, but it all worked out that way. <laughs> you are you already know. You already know. It's good to see you, Frat. Likewise, likewise. Glad to have you here. So let's talk about this here. Uh, you know, you have a MAGA Republican who's running. You've got a sitting Republican who refuses uh, to endorse or campaign for him. Other Republican sitting governors, uh, they gave in and, and they fell forward. Uh, and and, and what, the, what, your op, what your opponent wants to do is, frankly, continue the Donald Trump uh, January 6th agenda for the state of Maryland. That's, that's exactly right. I mean, uh, I am... Uh... I'm running against someone who, even in the debate that we had last night, continues to show himself as a very clear and a very present danger to the basic fabric of democracy. Where, uh, where you know, where when I when I define patriotism, you know, I define patriotism of when I left my family and I put on the uniform of this country and I serve with paratroopers overseas in Afghanistan. Uh, where you know his definition of patriotism was putting on a baseball cap and asking people to join him at the Capitol on January 6th. He is literally an election denier. And, and when I think about what it even means, where the, the, the schism in the, in the Republican Party that they're seeing right now, where you're absolutely right. I mean, the current Republican governor, the current Republican governor, has called him a QAnon whack job, has, told, has said that he is unfit to lead, uh, and has said that not only will he not support him to be the next governor, that he wouldn't even give him a tour of the governor's office. Those weren't my words. Those are the words of the current Republican governor. And so we're seeing here on full display that the, the people of the state of Maryland have a, have a very clear choice now about how they think the future, how they think about the future of the state and, uh, and what direction that we are going to go in. Um, one of the things that we saw take place, uh, Maryland finally uh, approved a settlement for HBCUs. Hogan initially vetoed that, uh, and then uh, he was forced to sign it after the legislature overrode uh, his veto. Uh, that was a huge issue there. When it comes to Maryland and African Americans, specifically when you look at Baltimore, uh, which you know very well, you know, you know, what is your agenda for that? We're talking about still significant education issues, but also economic issues. Uh, African Americans in Baltimore, people talk about Prince George's County and other county being the richest county in the country, uh, but you also have folks who are on the other end who don't even know what that prosperity looks and feels like. That's exactly right. And I got to tell you, I mean, the, the, the HBCU piece plays a big role now. I mean, listen, our, our state is blessed. We have four of the top HBCUs in this country here in the state of Maryland, right? Four top HBCUs in the state of Maryland. And when you look at what happened with the lawsuit, the lawsuit, yes, was passed, even though it got passed uh, over a veto override by, by the governor. Um, but we're still talking about uh, you know, a, a number that was not significant enough when you consider the challenge. Also, we consider how long this lawsuit has gone on. And the other thing is, is that the reason for the lawsuit, the challenge of it, which was the duplication of courses, and knowing that there were certain courses that they were not allowing to grow and thrive at these HBCUs, that practice is still happening. So we have to make sure that with this lawsuit that we're actually honoring and going and addressing why the lawsuit was filed in the first place. And, and why that becomes important in this bigger conversation is, I've been very clear on this campaign. This is about, this is about creating pathways for work, wages, and wealth. Work, wages, and wealth for all of our families across the state. And in order for us to do that, in order for us to have a world-class education system that's teaching our children how not just to be employees, but also how to be employers, making sure that we have an education system that's starting earlier while we are, and that's the reason I'm advocating for and we will get done having pre-K for every single child in need in the state of Maryland. 
making sure we can get fair wages for people, that we need to accelerate getting to a $15 minimum wage and also peg it to inflation, because we still have far too many people who are living, who are working, in some cases, multiple jobs, and living at or, or just above the poverty line. And when we're talking about wealth, this is about coming out with, the, uh, with that distinction of the difference between income and wealth. Those are two different things, and I want wealth for our communities. And that means just simply the idea of being able to own more than you owe, the ability to pass something on to your children besides debt. We've got to create pathways for work, wages, and wealth for all our communities, and our HBCUs getting a fair shake and a fair share is an important component to that. Housing is also a critical issue. I made the point about how, for so many years, people talked about Prince George's County, Maryland, being the richest county uh, in the country. And I actually told people, sorry, that's incorrect. And I understand why they were saying it, because when the housing crisis hit, a lot of those black folks lost their homes. I said, That's if right. you got wealth, you don't lose your home. And so, yes, right. folks own their homes, but they, but, but they simply uh, were impacted by loss of jobs, loss of wages, then they lost their home. Overall, 53% of black wealth was wiped out due to the home foreclosure crisis. What is your plan to address the housing issue uh, in Maryland? Because the problem we have right now, we have a housing shortage. We built, uh, we built less than 10 million homes uh, in 2010 to 2020, the fewest homes America has built since the 1930s. That's one of the reasons why we have a housing shortage and people being forced to be renters and paying exorbitant rates when they really can afford to be paying to own a home with some of these rental rates. That's exactly right. And, and if you look at Maryland, I mean, Maryland really is an extraordinary place when you consider uh, what has happened in Maryland, the history of Maryland. Because, we, listen, we, we are, we're the home of, 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 of Douglas. And, and Marshall and Tubman. But you know, we're also the home of redlining. Redlining started in the state of Maryland. And so you cannot talk about the, the gaps that we can see, that we continue to see, in particular, the racial wealth gap, where the racial wealth gap in the state of Maryland right now is eight to one, right? And mm -hmm. we all know that's not because one group is working eight times harder. There are systems that continue to allow that wealth gap to exist and allow it to continue to exacerbate and grow. And so there's a few different things that we have to be able to do to address the housing, the housing challenge. Uh, you know, one is we've got to do a better job of preserving the available inventory that we have. We have inventory that is just simply inhabitable in the state of Maryland, and that is urban, rural, and suburban areas. So we've got to do a better job of actually investing in and preserving the available inventory that can get people housed and affordable housing options. The second piece is we've got to produce more. For anybody who says, oh, yeah, we have enough affordable housing, we just need to get rid of regulatory red tape or that type of thing, my answer is, what neighborhoods are you spending time in? Because the neighborhoods that I'm spending time in, I know that inventory is still a problem, and we've got to produce more options. The third piece is, we've got to do a better job of protecting people who are inside of homes now. The number one driver of poverty in the state of Maryland is housing insecurity. And so when we say we need to protect our renters and put them on proper pathways, to ownership. That means things like making sure that we can have uh, a right to counsel in eviction court, because we know that in eviction court, landlords over 95% of the time will have counsel. Most tenants do not. And so you've got to be able to help level the playing field when it comes to eviction court. And it also means things like fully funding the Affordable Housing Trust in the state of Maryland, and also dealing with the issue of, 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 uh, of an historically redlined neighborhoods. There is an unfair appraisal value that is oftentimes placed. Unfair appraisal values have been the greatest wealth thefts that we have seen in the state of Maryland. And so making sure we can get fair appraisal values in historically redlined neighborhoods also is a key and a core and, and, and an important point and an important facet of what it means to both address the housing issue while also addressing the wealth gap. Questions from my panel, I'll start with uh, Torun. What's your question for Westmore? Hello, um, Mr. Moore. My question for you is, what you laid out is a very solid plan to get people energized to come out and vote for you. My question is, how is that messaging going out to um, your constituency or your potential constituency? Are they responding to this? Or are you uh, putting messaging together to make them understand this? Yes, sir. And thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, it is. And I'll tell you, the beautiful thing that we're watching, if you look at the primary race, you know, we had 10 people we ran against in a primary. And, and let's be clear, our primary consisted of, you know, two cabinet secretaries, two Obama cabinet secretaries, the former head of the DNC, 
three people that had either were either statewide or had run statewide before. And we ended up winning. And a lot of people were like, how in the world did you end up victorious in this primary field? And I think the answer is we went everywhere. We outworked everybody and we went everywhere to share our message that this is about work, wages and wealth. This is about economics. And the amazing thing that we continue to see and watch how people were being energized around it was it wasn't just folks in, in, in West Baltimore, it was folks in Westminster, right? Is that when we were going out and talking to the entrepreneur in, in Montgomery County, that they're saying, yeah, I agree. But it was also when we're heading out to the Eastern Shore and talking to the fishermen and the watermen and the farmers who are saying work, wa work wages and wealth, that's me too. And we we're saying, absolutely. So I learned very early uh, that we were going to go everywhere with our message, even places, frankly, where there weren't a lot of Democrats. Uh, because even when people say you're going a lot of places, there's not a lot of Democrats. My answer was always very simple. Yeah, but there's a lot of Marylanders, and I plan on being their governor, too. And if we can just get a chance to share our message and our values and our vision with them, that it would resonate to a victory. And I think we're, uh, we're, we're thankfully uh, seeing, uh, seeing that that uh, is looking like it might play out. Niambi. Well, hello. I'm also a hello, constituent yes. in Maryland. And I wanted to ask about this home ownership piece, because sometimes we promote home ownership as a way to wealth, but we know for far too many Black families, particularly those who are just making it, they don't have a lot of margins. And so yes. how do we talk about things like uh, over-assessment and property taxes for um, those same families, and that one of the ways that people lose their home is also just not being able to maintain in, in the upkeep of these homes. So what are the plans there to assist these people? We say we want them to be homeowners, we want them to be wealthy, but we also know that home ownership can be a boondoggle for those who might be more marginal in this market. Oh, God bless you. Uh, and I love... I love love the question, and uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say I, I, I humbly ask you for your vote too. Uh, <laughs> but you know the, the thing the thing that I also know is that you're absolutely right. I mean, when we're talking about increasing access for homeowners, when we're talking about making sure that people have a chance to be able to grow equity, because I want to create an ownership society in 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 the state of Maryland, and particularly in communities where that has not always been the case. And I believe that creating an ownership society is one of the core things that we can do to be able to address this racial wealth gap that continues to grow. But part of that also means that it has to come with that measurement of education, not just of the buyer, though, but it's also of the appraisers. It's also of the real estate agents that this cannot just simply be how are we moving fast as fast as quickly towards the sale. But those education factors have to be factored in into all the different elements of home ownership. You know, so, for example, you know, a few years back, uh, I worked on a bill within the Maryland General Assembly on unfair appraisal values for historically redlined neighborhoods. And part of the one of the aspects of that bill was making sure that appraisers had a structural history, both of the history of redlining in the state of Maryland and, and the appraisal gap that we continue to see. But then also it was about how are you using that to help educate the buyer about the different locations and the different geographies that they are buying in. Both of those two pieces became not just important, but were important facets and aspects of the bill that were eventually included. And so you're absolutely right. I mean, we have to, we have to encourage membership me measures of ownership. Uh, we want to encourage people to be, you know, to not just be, to not be renters, but to be owners. But we also have to encourage people to be educated buyers. So it's not putting people in, frankly, a, a tougher situation than the one they enter, entered into. And we're not having the same implications that we saw after 2008, where it literally took, we have families who have still not recovered from 2008. And you're looking at the massive wealth lost that took place after, uh, you know, after, after the Wall Street meltdown. Greg Carr. Thank you, Brother Roland. <clears throat> and thanks, Brett. It's good to see you, brother. Um, good to see you, too, Brett. Good to see you. Yes, sir. I don't know whether it's going to be on the 8th of November, Election Day, or maybe early voting starting the 27th of this month, but I will be casting my vote again for you like I did in the primary at Montgomery County, brother. So um, I, I knew... I <laughs> oh, yeah, of course, brother. I, I know something was going on when I got in the car and heard Oprah Winfrey cut a, 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 a commercial <laughs> for you. And I thought, okay, Oprah's trying to get ahead of this. The first time I met Barack Obama, he was a state senator in Illinois, and I knew him because, they, oh, that's the guy that wrote the book Dreams of My Father. 
your book, The Other West More, I think is something I think everybody should read. I mean, you in the conversations with your brother who's up at Jessup, could you talk a little bit perhaps about your vision in a state that is what, about 40% non-white, at least the voting electorate is, a uh, third of that probably black people, 30% plus. You know, what messages from Maryland would you like the country to be paying attention to in terms of how we deal with questions of race and class and extreme inequality by building these coalitions? And, and good luck to you and, and Delegate Miller, who also another fantastic uh, presence there on the ticket. So um, what lessons should we be learning from your campaign and from the way you envision governing in Maryland? Thank you so much, Brother Carr, and, and sincerely, thank you. Uh, and I appreciate you, and I appreciate your leadership. And I appreciate your leadership in our community. Sincerely, uh, you know, and and I think about it, and and first, let me just say, and and I also want to say I'm I'm thankful that you acknowledged uh, my running mate, Delegate Aruna Miller, uh, because I, it's important for for me to be able to share with people uh, that uh, that my running mate is remarkable. Uh, she is uh, she is uh, a, a seasoned and a respected legislator out of Montgomery County. She is a uh, a, a transportation and a civil engineer by training. And also important people to understand and remember is that uh, that if we're elected, because we run as a ticket, if we're elected on November 8, she will also be the first immigrant ever elected in the history of this, uh, statewide, in the history of the state of Maryland. Uh, if, if she's elected, we're elected, uh, it will also be the first time in the history of this country that you will have a ticket, both a governor and a lieutenant governor, who are both people of color. First time in the history of this country. And, 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 I, and I think about the messaging that we have, because a lot of people ask that question. They're like, you know, what does it mean and what will it look like if, you know, as you all are going through on this journey? And my answer was, you know, I, when I was 17 years old, I joined the Army. And I wasn't old enough to join the Army when I first signed up. My mother had to sign the paperwork for me. Uh, but uh, as, you, as you know, uh, Brother Carr and Brother Martin, after, after my teenage years, uh, my mother would sign whatever paperwork they put in front of her because uh, I had some challenges coming up. And, uh, but, you know, but I remember they taught us something in our first days of military training. And it was a mantra they asked us to live by, and I did. And the mantra was simple. Leave no one behind. Ever. That if you get one of my people, I will send a battalion in to go get them if I have to. We leave no one behind. And that is not just a mantra, it's a value statement. And it's not just a value statement. Come January, that will be the new mission for the state of Maryland. We will be a state that leaves no one behind. Because we are dealing with situations and communities where so many have felt left behind, where there's been measurements of economic growth, where there's been measurements of economic, uh, you know, of, 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 of economic prosperity, where there's been measures of, of, of educational, uh, you know, educational limitless. And people have felt left behind from that. Where we can have some of the best technology companies in the state of Maryland, which we do, biotech, cybertech, agritech. Yet at the same time, I spend time in communities every single day where children still do not have access to broadband or Wi-Fi that we can be a state of some of the best, uh, you know, after some of the best black entrepreneurs in this country exist here in the state of Maryland, where we could be on the cusp of having our first black governor, only the third in the history of this country. Yet at the same time, the state of Maryland incarcerates more African-American boys between the ages of 18 and 25 than anywhere else in this country. Number two is Mississippi. So we have got to build a state that leaves no one behind. And if we can do that, I think that is gonna be an incredibly powerful message, not just to the state of Maryland, about how do we embrace our, our beauty and our diversity, and that's the most beautiful thing about our state, is just how incredibly beautiful and diverse the state is. But at the same time, we're gonna send a message to the rest of the country that if you wanna win, if you wanna build, if you wanna compete, if you wanna grow, we've gotta do it collectively, and you cannot allow these gaps to continue to exist in our society. All right, then. Again, Westmore, uh, Democrat running for governor of Maryland. Frat, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, look forward to having you back, uh, and I look forward to uh, seeing uh, an alpha. 
uh, become uh, governor. Uh, Omega's love touting uh, Doug Wilder <laughs> being the first, but uh, we always got to remind them who's first of all, as the hat says, servants of all, we shall servants transcend all. Servants of all, we shall transcend all. And I said, Annapolis has a beautiful, has right in front of the state house, there's a beautiful uh, lawn. And I said, oh, it's not the lawn. We're about to turn that into the yard. There you go. <laughs> all right. Westmore, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. God bless y'all. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. All right, folks. Maryland, y'all get out and vote. Uh, make that happen. Westmore to become the next governor of Maryland. Again, will be the third African-American elected in history to a state's uh, top spot. Doug Wilder was the first. Deval Patrick was second in Massachusetts. Uh, you got Westmore. Of course, Stacey Abrams is also running in Georgia. So, folks, got to go to a break real quick. We come back. We're going to talk about uh, a sister who owns the company helping you uh, when it comes to losing weight and also not running to go for cosmetic surgery for your breasts and for your butt. Her, she says her products can actually help you increase your breast size and your butt size. Really? Let's see what she has to say after the break. You're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. When we invest in ourselves, our glow, our vision, our vibe, we all shine. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. You know what's on the ballot. It's not just legislation and policies we believe in. It's democracy. Our democracy. There's a choice on the ballot between freedom and fear, between cruelty and compassion, between chaos and community, between voting or violence, and the end of rights generations have fought for. The extremists have a plan, a roadmap for a nation where your voice is silenced and your vote is a memory, where they count their votes and cast ours aside. That's why this year, this fight, this vote is so important. Register, engage, volunteer, fight back against the disinformation and despair, and most of all, vote, because your vote is all that stands between our future and theirs. This is Judge Matthews. What's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Mac Wild. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's your boy, Jacob Lattimore, and you're now watching Roland Martin right now. Eee. All right, so getting the body you want is challenging for a lot of people, but uh, what if there's a product that actually can help you do that, uh, that can help burn fat, enhance your curves, as well as block cellulite formation? My next guest, she said uh, her product actually can do that. Uh, body by Chris, uh, of course, uh, is the name of the company. It's founded by uh, Chriselle Johnson. Uh, she's here to talk about that. For sure, glad to have you uh, on the show. Uh, a lot of people out there obviously want to be slimmer. Uh, you've got folks out there, they get Brazilian butt lifts, and they are sitting there putting their lives on the line. Folks sitting here getting, uh, of course, uh, breast augmentation as well. And so talk about your product, how it was put together, and what it actually does. Hi, so my uh, products are organic skincare, 100% natural ingredients. It permanently, it permanently strength, strengths the fat cells in your stomach. It dehydrates the fat cells. It causes you to sweat and lose weight instantly. It's very, it's very effective. It's, it's fast results. It smells amazing, and it changed my life. 
So I you've at, so you've actually posted photos of yourself uh, of what you used to look like and how you use the particular products uh, to uh, uh, to change uh, your body. And again, like I said, there are a lot of people out here uh, they putting their lives on the line trying to get these butt lifts and doing all this other sort of plastic surgery uh, to get the perfect body. And uh, your whole deal is. That's crazy that people are going through all of that, especially flying to other countries, not knowing who the hell you're even dealing with. Yes, that's super dangerous. My ingredients are super organic and natural. It's super safe. It's easy. It's fast results. And I really recommend people use my products instead of getting surgery because surgery is very dangerous. People are dying every day from it. So, um, so in terms of, uh, you know, your background, how did you, first of all, when did you start and who did you meet with uh, in terms of scientists, whatever, to begin to put uh, this together? I started three years ago. Um, I basically just wanted to start because I was very small and I wanted to, you know, have more curves as an influencer and model. So I came up with these ingredients and it definitely works and I love it. And I get a lot of results. I get a lot of reviews. People love it. Questions from the panelists. Uh, Niambe, you first. So are you, I, I, don't, I don't know much about your projects, so I apologize, but are you suggesting that people use your product in addition to doing exercise or use your products alone and they'll see these results? Um, you can use it alone. Like you don't have to work out. You can mold your stomach. You can wear a waist trainer and make you lose inches off your stomach. Um, you can lose three to four inches off your stomach just waist train, but I like to work out as well because it's faster results. If, if you're in the gym uh, one day, you can lose three inches off your stomach. It gets hot and it's permanent results and it makes you sweat instantly. And that was my problem. I, I didn't never, I never sweated in the gym that much. So, mm -hmm. um, our products definitely help with that. So I wasn't losing weight because I never sweat. To run! <laughs> Um, my question is, um, does um, diet affect this as well, along with your product? Do you think diet also helps with getting your body the way you want it to be? You can definitely diet. That definitely helps and improves the results. Um, like I say, you don't have to work out, but that definitely have a faster, like, result if you diet, yes. How many, uh, in terms of folks, uh, have been taking advantage of the products? I've seen your social media pages, uh, but in terms of different client, number of clients around the country, who you've been have, helping? And men, have, men and women, correct? Yes, it's for men and women, all genders. I had over 100 sales. I have a lot of returning clients. They love it. Gotcha. Uh, Greg Carr, your question. Thank you, Roland. Uh, Sister Chriselle, I think I'm okay with the booty and the bust. However, I should maybe <laughs> get rid of this gut. Uh, <laughs> but let me ask you, uh, let me ask you, sis, um, since it seems like it's gender neutral, any uh, any side effects or precautions as people uh, apply your product? I'm just thinking about that. Um, some people, I mean, not really. Like, some people may be like, it's not really. Like, some people say... It makes them sweat a lot. It makes it gets hot, but not. I haven't really got any complaints, honestly. So, well, actually, well, because you said actually, if it heats your body up, yeah, you're more than likely uh, to sweat. Uh, at somebody on uh, somebody on the YouTube uh, channel, they asked, "Is she a chemist?" Uh, and so, when you when you've been working with this here, uh, I, uh, you know, who did you work with to put the formula together uh, for the product? I work with uh, different types of people. I work with other skincare products, um, people. I work with uh, people People in the... Um, I work with a lot of people that got approved, and they told me, like, my products and my ingredients were correct. They're organic skincare. It's 100% natural ingredients. And so they helped me a lot, but I'm not, I haven't had got I haven't got a lot of complaints yet. Okay. Uh, well, look. For, first of all, the number of people out there. First of all, the skincare uh, industry uh, has exploded. We're talking about uh, you know you know multiple billions uh, that has happened. Uh, numerous people actually who have been creating uh, various product lines, and so uh, Body by Chris is one of them. Here is uh, how you can, she can be reached, folks. Uh, right here. Pull it up. Uh, right there, pull up the, uh, the graphic in terms of how you can access the website. Um, it goes right there. Instagram at bodybychris underscore. Website is bodybychris, C-H-R-A-S dot C-O. Uh, Chriselle, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, good luck uh, with your company, building your company. Thank you. And thanks so much. 
Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, folks. Uh, again, one of the reasons why we created Marketplace, uh, because there are a number of Black-owned companies out there. We've had folks uh, who've been reaching out to us. We've got folks, of course, lined up uh, over the next couple of months that, that we'll be featuring. And so we surely appreciate uh, when we do connect uh, with African Americans. Uh, because like what I always say, uh, people always talk about when we need more Black-owned businesses. But I keep saying you got to have Black-owned businesses with scale. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of black-owned businesses with one employee, uh, and then they're dealing with small amounts of revenue. But you got to be able to build and grow it in order to actually uh, be successful. Uh, Niambe, I certainly appreciate it. Greg, thanks a lot. To run, thanks a bunch as well, uh, folks. That is it for us. We appreciate uh, all of y'all who are watching. Don't forget, download the Black Start Network app, available on all platforms: Apple Phone, Android Phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, uh, Samsung Smart TV as well. Of course, you can also. Uh, support us uh, by becoming a member of the Brina Funk fan club. Every dollar you give goes to the show to make, uh, to make it possible for us to do what we do. Uh, check and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. And, of course, you can also, um, uh, of course, uh, get up the book White Fear, How the Brown of Americans Make White Folks Lose Their Mind. Available on Ben Bella Books, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Indie Bound, Bookshop, Chapters, Books A Million, Target. Uh, you can also order from your favorite black bookstore or of course uh, download it on Audible. Shout out to Tommy Williams, Tristan Wilson, Archellas Pons, Michelle Henry, uh, also Evelyn, uh, Tony Mosley, Corey Brown, uh, uh, all the folks who actually gave on Cash App doing the show, uh, the folks who actually gave on Zelle doing the show, give me one second, uh, Jocelyn uh, Brome, uh, Jocelyn, we certainly appreciate it uh, as well, and let's see here, PayPal, uh, give a shout out to uh, Elgin Anderson, Elgin, thank you so very much, uh, Lola Troy Publishing, thank you so very much. Uh, and let's see here. I think we got one more. Mary Gates, thank you very much as well. Folks, that is it. I'll see y'all tomorrow right here on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Ho!